Congressman Jamie Raskin is a Democrat of Maryland. He served on the January 6th committee. He's the ranking member of the Oversight Committee, and he joins me now. Congressman, News Speaker Mike Johnson, your thoughts. Uh, well, you cannot get to the right of Mike Johnson in the MAGA caucus. Um, it's just it's inconceivable that you could get to the right of him. Um, I mean, there are people who are definitely more lunatic than he is. Um, and he's got very good manners and he's an able lawyer. But um, when we say he opposed democracy, we know that from his giving a legal gloss and finish to all of Donald Trump's arguments about electoral fraud and making the independent state legislature doctrine argument, which um, the Supreme Court fortunately did not bite on. Um, but if he's not for democracy, what's he for? He's for theocracy. He wants a nationwide ban on abortion with no exceptions for uh, rape or incest. Uh, he voted against affirming women's right to travel across state lines for the purposes of obtaining health care. Um, he's also voted against reaffirming women's contraceptive rights. Um, he is uh, a real enemy of Social Security, from my perspective. He wanted to increase the age of uh, Social Security retirement to 70 years old. He's very much in the Steve Bannon mode of trying to dismantle the regulatory state, by which they mean democracy itself. And so um, he's a, a decent guy and he's a, a nice guy, but nobody should be fooled by it. Donald Trump cemented his hold over the Republican Party today, and he is in control of the House of Representatives right now. Yeah. Also, I'm just going to go out and make a prediction. I usually don't do this. He, he, Trump's going to be mad at him at some point. He's going to turn on him at some point. He's going to betray Trump at some point. Like, we've watched this a, a, a million times, right? <laughs> this is, I mean, Kevin McCarthy, you know, went down to Mar-a-Lago to kiss the ring. He, he, he took all the wrong colored starbursts, starbursts out of his, uh, you know, out of his bowl to present to Donald Trump. And, and what good did that do him? The guy got cut loose. So, like, I, I don't know how long the clock is on Mike Johnson. The, the future's undetermined. Yeah. And they could end up having a major conflict over abortion. I mean, for Mike Johnson, he really believes that yes, true it should be a crime for someone to have abortion. For Donald Trump, of course, he's completely flexible on the issue. He used it in order to take over the Republican Party and he appointed uh, radical anti-choice justices. But at this point, he'd like to leave it alone because he knows how to read a poll. So it'll be interesting to see what happens between the two of them. Mike Johnson's a true believer. I was reflecting today as the voting was going on that if he watched The Handmaid's Tale, he would not be rooting for June Osborne. He'd be rooting for Gilead the whole, entire time. He, he comes from the religious right part of the party. He worked for ADF, which is a sort of, you know, right wing legal org that's brought a whole bunch of suits. When uh, a Louisiana newspaper, he wrote an op ed in 2003 decrying the Supreme Court, uh, striking down sodomy laws, saying that prescriptions against sodomy have deep roots in religion, politics and law. When Louisiana instituted its, its abortion ban in June 2022, breaking late yesterday, the Department of Health informed abortion facilities in our state the right to life has now been restored. Perform an abortion, get imprisoned at hard labor for one to 10 years and find 10K to 100K. What does it portend for democracy, the defining feature of what happened to Emmer, like the interaction between Emmer coming, rising to the surface, Trump being like, nope, he's on the wrong side of the most important issue, which is that he's not a coup better. Emmer dropping out four hours later, and then Mike Johnson, coup a better, that's my guy. What, is, what are the implications of that? Well, Trump vetoed Emmer. He um, plucked Johnson out of obscurity and propelled him to the speakership. Um, you know, if we were to allow these people to take over the House, the Senate, and the White House, we would be where Hungary is today. It's illiberal democracy that they're interested in. Tight control over the electoral process to make sure the results always move in an authoritarian direction. And then cracking down on civil rights and civil liberties, the rights of women. They're profoundly anti-gay. They're against the right of gay people to get married. They would try to roll the clock back 50 years in America. That's really where they are at this point. So the stakes have been drawn real clearly in terms of the 2024 election. We've got the, the Democratic Party, the party of democracy and freedom against the GOP, which has a bag of tricks in voter suppression, gerrymandering of federal and state 
legislative districts, right-wing judicial activism, the filibuster, all of those things to try to prevent real democratic priorities. And that's going to be the struggle um, against the theocrats and the autocrats and the kleptocrats and, you know, Vladimir Putin moving into the 2024 election. Yeah. Speaking of Vladimir Putin, we'll talk about that in a second uh, in our next guest about how that, that next piece of legislation is going to look. Congressman Jamie Raskin, thank you very much. Today, for the first time, Donald Trump took the stand in one of his many trials, not the, the two federal trials, not the Georgia racketeering trial, not the hush money trial, the civil fraud trial underway in Manhattan right now. Trump's been attending every day, doesn't apparently have anything better to do, and he was summoned to the witness stand by the judge himself to answer for a potential violation of a gag order the judge imposed three weeks ago. That gag order came after Trump posted a photo to social media of the court's clerk attacking her. And the gag order banned Trump from, reasonably, I'd say, quote, posting or speaking publicly about the judge's staff. Well, this morning, Trump went to the cameras outside the courtroom and he said this. If we had a jury, it would have been fair, at least, even if it was a somewhat negative jury, because no negative jury would vote against me. But this judge will, because this judge is a very partisan judge, with a person who's very partisan sitting alongside of him. Perhaps even much more partisan than he is. You see, he said the judge, the judges, with a partisan person sitting alongside him. The judge took issue with that comment, summoned Trump to the witness stand to answer for it. Answer for it. He asked him, quote, to whom were you referring when you said the person sitting alongside of him? You and Cohn, Trump said. The judge asked, are you sure you didn't mean the person on the other side of me, my principal law clerk? Yes, I am sure. Later, the judge asked Trump, quote, don't you always refer to Michael Cohn as Michael Cohn? <laughs> no, Trump said. His attorneys jumped in to help him out with Chris Kyes insisting many things even worse than that. Lena Haba adding, quote, yes, Your Honor, I can confirm that much worse. The judge then made his decision, and I quote the judge here, as the trier of fact, I find the witness is not credible that he was referring to my law clerk, who is principal law clerk, who is sitting much closer to me, who doesn't have a barrier, whom I believe has been accused by the defendant of being partisan or Democrat or partisan Democrat. I hereby fine you $10,000, which is on the low side, to be paid within 30 days to the lawyer's fund for client protection. Now, about 45 minutes after that, the judge denied a motion by Trump's lawyer. And to the apparent surprise of his attorneys, Trump stormed out of the courtroom with Secret Service chasing behind. Irate and red-faced, he stopped, only to talk to the scrambling cameras outside the courtroom. The witness just admitted that we won the trial. And the judge should end this trial immediately. Thank you. The witness admitted no such thing. Joining me now are two people who are in the courtroom for that incredible scene in different roles. Former federal prosecutor Donya Perry, who represents Michael Cohn, and MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin. I feel like in the times that I've reported from court, I have occasionally witnessed dramatic scenes, but largely it's actually been pretty boring and rote and not like television. Today was wild. Today, as Danya and I were discussing before we came on set with you, it was a little bit like watching Legally Blonde. For our viewers who know this movie well, there's a moment at the end of the movie where a witness on the stand breaks down, admits to a crime, and then the judge essentially rules the trial over <laughs> because Elle Woods' client is not guilty. And that is exactly what Cliff Robert, who represents the Trump sons expected to happen today. He moved for what's called a directed verdict. That's asking the judge basically truncate the trial, end it now and find for us. And he didn't do that. But that's what they expected to happen. And they honestly seemed surprised. And Trump seemed just downright angry that that's not what happened. It was definitely like television or a film. Uh, so your client, was he in the room today as well? He was. He started the day on the stand, right? He was on the stand almost the entire day, other than for the portion of the day where the judge found Mr. Trump not credible. Right. So what happens is Trump comes out and says that thing, right? Which, I don't know, you guys were in the room and sort of caught the vibe. It seems to me obvious he was talking about the judge's clerk who he has a fixation on, who the lawyers apparently have a little bit of fixation on. Is that a fair reading? Do you think there's any context clues he was actually talking about your client, Michael Cohen? Well, when he wants to talk about Michael Cohen, he says Michael Cohen. Yeah. In fact, he did in a true social post last evening. He did in front of the cameras today. So he certainly knows how to direct his vitriol uh, at 
in Mr. Cohen's general direction. So I, I, I certainly think the judge had ample support for his credibility determination. You know, without the rest of the quote, it's a little bit arguable. You could even be generous to Trump and say it's ambiguous. But there was a portion of that quote that we didn't have an opportunity to play on air where he returns to talking about Michael Cohen. And that, to me, makes it even more clear that at the very beginning, he is indeed talking about the judge's principal law clerk because then he changes subjects to talk about Michael Cohen. And just, again, to be clear here, like, uh, just you guys putting on your, like, experience in a courtroom. I mean, going after a judge's clerk, posting them on social media when you are a person who, when you draw attention to people, often they will receive, they will have security concerns. Posting a picture, being ordered by the judge to take it down, not taking down one of them, getting a fine for that and then coming out and, and, and in your veiled and clever way talking about that. I mean, that's totally out of bounds, right? Totally. Out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just I've like, I'm that. like, how is this? And it just seems like one of these things where from the beginning this started, this is a guy who's got one mode. Test, 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 test. And now we're seeing it in every different venue with with uh, Judge Chutkin, right? Judge Chutkin gives him a gag order. Yep. Then she temporarily lifts the gag order pending an appeal, and he goes on Truth Social and violates, he's not violating it, gag order stayed, the failing New York Times story leaked by deranged Jack Smith, blah, 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 goes after a guy who might be a witness, like, exactly go, like, Kyle Cheney of Politico said it right this morning. He said it was like a checklist of how to violate the gag order. You know, Chris, I'd also point out to you, though, that even if the gag order is stayed, he still has conditions of release that include not violating any state, federal, or local statutes. There is a witness tempering statute, 18 U.S.C. 1512. I encourage our viewers to look it up. It's arguable that he violated that, even if that federal gag order is stayed. But you're right. He's trying to test at every front. And sometimes he might not even be trying. I really do think he has a problem with impulse control and certainly has a problem with listening to his lawyers. So I, I should note, in the same way that there's like this colorable claim it was about Michael Cohen. In this case, the Troop Social Post was about the documents case, right, which is not Tanya Shutkin's case. Now, at the same time, all this drama is happening, right? Trump gets pulled up onto the witness stand to testify in his own defense by the judge about whether he's going to find him in violation. Your client is in the room and he gets a subpoena today? Uh, last night. Last sure. night? About While he's on cross-examination in the Manhattan District Attorney's criminal case, Trump's lawyers in that case, and there's some overlap, and they were in the courtroom today, issued a subpoena to him. And I don't want to get into it because I haven't had time yet to formulate my legal strategy. Um, but but it this certainly was a subpoena to testify in that case? For documents. For documents. Yeah, documents that, you know, they, clearly it has the stink of witness intimidation once again, at least to, to, to me. Um, after all of this, I mean, there's the, 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 this judge has tried hard to keep these, this trial going, right? Um, and there's been back and forth about the different arguments that are made. Um, where is the trial now in terms of its arc? There are about 27 witnesses that the New York Attorney General intends to put on. I'd have to go back to the list to see where we are. I don't think we're halfway through that yet. Wow. Tomorrow, we're expecting testimony from Sherry Dillon, who is the Morgan Lewis partner who was principally in charge of Trump's legal tax work. She's a person known to us because she was at that infamous press conference with the huge stacks of paper. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, see, I say that to someone who's a cable news host, and they're, yes. oh, Sherry Dillon, yeah, you know yeah, her. Yeah. I know but, that sound. We play that. But I think we'll be here for a few more weeks. And certainly, they are trying to delay and stall at every turn. You saw that yesterday they made a huge issue out of a COVID outbreak on the attorney general's side, trying to use that to delay trial a day further. And yet, nobody on the Trump side of the courtroom was wearing a mask, which Judge Ngoron noted to them were, were widely available and they were free to wear. No one's more, uh, you know, uh, COVID neurotic than Donald, <laughs> Donald J. Trump. Donya Perry, Lisa Rubin, thank you both. Thank, thank you. you.